Sorry, I was told to wait for the music, so hence the slight hesitation. Um, I'm up here on behalf of the uh, Digital World Summit Advisory Committee. Um, and before I begin, I'd like those committee members to actually stand up and show yourselves. So Suzanne Lorty, Suzanne, stand up. Uh, Jose Plamondon, Jose's right here. Jeremy Bailey, if you could peek out from behind the curtain. And Martin Lassalle, unfortunately, uh, can't join us because he's stuck in Chicago. Um, he was at South by Southwest. So this committee has been, thank you very much, this committee has been meeting for the better part, oh yes, let's. Uh, this committee has been meeting for the better part of a year. Uh, we've been sharing with each other, debating with each other, um, pushing Canada Council uh, members to uh, broaden their horizons. They push back at us, et cetera. And it's been a really wonderful um, set of uh, conversations that we've had in helping shepherd and bring this um, entire uh, fund uh, to, to its you know, reality today, as well as to help with the summit. And so we hope that you guys really have a wonderful two days um, sharing with each other, because we certainly felt that way when we met um, so many times over the course of the past year. So our, our kind of, the reason for me being up on the stage is because as a committee, we really felt that we needed to contextualize um, for everyone what we should be thinking about in the next two days. And um, I'll first tell you about what we should not be thinking about and then move on to what we believe uh, we can help you uh, sort of uh, frame, how, how you can frame your, your minds and your attitudes as you um, embark on the workshops that you'll be doing over the course of the next few days. The first thing that you should not be thinking about is you should not be thinking that you've somehow not managed to adapt enough to digital, okay? Uh, we don't want you to think that somehow the art sector is lagging in digital or that somehow we need to then get with the program. Because in fact, we believe that the art sector has a leadership role in actually figuring out what this next stage of this technological revolution is going to be. So I use this particular quote um, from a book called Rethinking Technologies that was written in 1993 because this was pre-web. And at that time, a lot of the academics, a lot of the practitioners, a lot of the theoreticians were looking at how to rethink about technologies and ensure that technologies get rechanneled to become uh, a productive mode and uh, towards collective becoming. And I think we're now at the same sort of juncture in 2017 as we start to really figure out what this next wave of technological evolution is going to be. And I think our role as the art sector is critical to ensure that the new sets of technologies are done in such a way that they become productive modes for collective becoming. And collectivism presupposes that everyone has an equal voice on the table, and we think that the art sector has an equal voice at that table. And so what we're going to talk about very, very quickly is the seven transformations to get us future ready to take our seat at that table, okay? So I want you guys to be really pumped for this. The first one is we got talked a lot at us about the attention economy and how, you know, the scarcity factor that we have in the world today is attention. Um, attention is scarce, therefore, you know, Simone talked about this with the, the, the imp, you know, the, the stuff he talked about with fake news, the fact that clicks and likes and things like that are driving this, um, this uh, demand for attention that's so scarce for all sorts of publisher and content uh, creators um, uh, uh, have. So we, we, we then fall into this habit of then fighting for attention of being, being uh, driven to create new types of processes, frameworks, products to vie for attention because that's what's so scarce. Well, we know, given what's happened in the past little while, that in fact, that attention economy is short-lived and that we're actually moving into an intention economy, okay? And this is a phrase uh, 
that was um, sort of uh, created by Doc Searles, who wrote a book in 2012 called The Intention Economy. And the, the kind of uh, theory that he had was, as consumers actually armed with technologies become more adept at understanding what their needs are, they will be driving the bus in many ways, and that they're going to drive what it is that they want from the products that they need, and from the companies that they, whose products they need, and from the cultural organizations whose experiences they need, and that they're the drivers of this bus. So this intention economy is largely going to be facilitated by things like AI, by machine learning, by algorithms, by all these things that we now hear a lot about. So we are well on our way to becoming part or to, to transforming the attention economy into this intention economy. But what doesn't often get said, and this is something that's critical in Doc Searle's book, is that it also implies that the consumer owns the, the data in order to be able to drive that bus. And right now, there's a tension between who owns that data, corporations mainly, and how that data gets used. So if we want to move into this intention economy where our audiences have a no understand what it is that they want from us and we are you know, willing to engage in a conversation with them about what to bring them, then they also need to have some ability to manage their personal data that they have online. So this, this movement towards an idealized state of the kind of um, more equal economic structure that the internet could have through the intention economy demands that we have a different relationship to data than wh what we have now. And so what we're really thinking, talking about is moving from this notion of big data as being something that is um, sort of owned solely by monopolistic corporate structures um, to something that is being driven by need. So as a sector, we need to understand what our relationship is to big data and understand that what we really are thinking about is what our relationship is to big synthesis, okay? So data is only as good as what we glean from it. So insights become much more important than the data itself. Um, what we, how we contextualize data, the kinds of questions we ask to, uh, to, to aggregate that data, um, the types of biases that we might put into the system as we collect data, all of these things are driven by, the by what we're trying to synthesize. So what we're trying to collect, why we're trying to actually aggregate this data, and the need that we have for it. So again, I think as the art sector, we need to start to understand that although we need to play a role in how um, the digital economy has uh, sort of evolved, and we need to understand how it works, we also need, as Simone says, to go back to first principles and really go back to the why. Why do we need this stuff? What are we doing with it? How are we using it? How are we collecting it? Who is it for? And how do we actually glean the right types of insights that we need in order to um, create a more either equal relationship with our audiences, a more um, equal society? So from big data, we go to big synthesis. So I think that's a big transformation that's gonna start to happen over the next little while too in terms of the technologies that are being developed. Um, Part and parcel of this whole big data talk is obviously algorithms, okay? So understanding how they work, understanding what drives them, understanding um, the technologies that are implicit in, um, in what's, you know, uh, how, how contextual, con contextual engines are being made, et cetera, is something that we're all going to need to uh, sort out in our heads, however, I don't, think that, um, I don't think that fully grasping what are algorithms is ever going to be uh, fully necessary unless we understand that at the heart of this whole thing is that we don't actually want algorithms to drive everything about what it means to be human. So as Yuval Noah Harari says, um, as long as you have greater insight and self-knowledge than the algorithms, your choices will be still superior and you will keep at least some authority in your hands. 
If the algorithms nevertheless seem poised to take over, it is mainly because most human beings hardly know themselves at all. So this, this, this attempt for all of us to essentially automate everything that we're doing, to gather data about our preferences, and then to essentially predict what our needs are, um, is where technology is going into the future. But I think as the art sector, we need to understand that the study of consciousness of what, what makes us different and what provides greater insight and self-knowledge to us will always trump that particular um, techno-deterministic push towards uh, uh, predicting what the human being is all about, okay? So uh, the key point around that transformation is that although algorithms are becoming a key part of the technological revolution in this next few phases, I think it's important to still understand that consciousness and understanding what consciousness is all about is gonna be part and parcel of what we have to keep putting back on the table when we're at that table collectively figuring out what this next new sets of technology evolution will be about. Um, another thing we're hearing is virtual reality. So for virtual reality, I think it's important that what we really need to understand about it is that we need to fully understand the hidden reality that virtual reality could bring. Um, in many ways, the technology sector is pushing towards the pieces of the virtual reality uh, technology ecosystem to evolve to the point where everything that you experience in VR becomes indistinguishable from reality. But in fact, what we want to do is to do what the artists like Char Davies well in, you know, from the 90s have done, which is really to look at virtual reality as a space to explore those spaces and, 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 and um, hidden spaces in ourselves uh, so that we can actually fully understand consciousness again. So it's not about the literal representation of the world, but it's about the, the ability for us to use virtual reality to understand the hidden spaces of what makes us human. So again, this is something that the art sector can bring to the table as we talk about what this next stage of evolution is all about. So as people keep talking about VR, the art sector can push towards actually making us understand what being human is all about. Social media. So, so obviously, uh, the past you know, 10 years has been about the rise of social media and how that has dominated a lot of what um, we as um, arts institutions as, are supposed to uh, concentrate on, et cetera. Well, what's really heartening is I think we're moving away from the dominance of social media. It's still dominant, don't get me wrong. But the new conversation is really all about cooperative media and subscription media. And this is very, very new and it's very exciting because I think what we're seeing is we're actually seeing the results of what happens when um, the kind of attention is being aggregated in a single space that for which there are no controls. You know, so attention being aggregated within the Facebook platform, for example, where the controls are not present to uh, help parse out fake news is another example, right? And so what we're seeing is the public actually migrating to those spaces um, where they have some trust in the platforms being created. So again, Simone uh, referred to this earlier today by saying that the rise of subscriptions of newspapers are, are rising somewhat and that everyone needs to feel a little bit heartened that there is in fact um, a push towards uh, the public and audiences going to those trusted platforms. There was, a, there was an article in the New York Times yesterday about the growth of Patreon, um, which is a, a, a monetization platform that helps audiences essentially provide tips to creators. And so a lot of YouTube creators, a lot of um, other forms of creators are now using that system to help sustain their livelihoods. And so, uh, in fact, it was um, Farhud Manju who wrote that, you know, the internet is actually not killing culture, um, it's, it's supporting it. And he can now write that because of this trend towards actual, pu the public and audiences starting to, to support in ways where, with the money, uh, creators that they're, that they're um, sort of attached to and engaged with. 
So I think this is some, a trend that we all need to watch is to really think about how uh, instead of concentrating solely on what our Facebook strategy should be, maybe it's about how do we start to think about cooperative media, um, cooperative media meaning are there platforms we could be working together with other types of arts institutions that could be shared amongst multiple organizations and therefore aggregate audiences in that fashion? And is there a way for us once we've engaged with those audiences, can we help them to start understanding that they need to start paying for this? So I think this is a, uh, you know, I'm very, very excited about this particular trend line. Um, the other thing that we've noticed, you know, that we've often talked about um, uh, in terms of the evolution of digital media, especially in the 90s and the early 2000s, is the need to invest in infrastructure, right? So, and, and, and I'm not saying that the digital divide does not exist. There are still places and regions in Canada, for sure, that don't have the kind of internet connectivity that they should have. However, I think we've failed somewhat in not addressing um, a more, a more and equally important infrastructure um, sort of uh, uh, place, which is the ethical framework surrounding um, how we actually relate to each other in this digital networked environment. So this, is, this goes beyond things like um, privacy rights or terms and conditions, um, but things that speak to the heart of what, actually of what is actually the monetization or the dominant monetization model of the internet today, which is really around um, what types of data should be collected, are they allowed to be collected, um, do we adhere to those types of practices, um, how transparent should we be in terms of engaging in those practices with our audiences, et cetera. So I think what we'll start to see as we um, move into uh, hopefully a more regulated framework, a more regulated environment for media, because it's becoming more and more ubiquitous and definitely becoming more impactful, um, news being one, et cetera, uh, that this conversation around what the ethical framework is is gonna be a critical one. And part of that conversation is really around privacy, as I said, and this is the transformation of that privacy conversation into digital human rights conversation. So what are the rights that we have now that we are actually digital humans, okay? You could say that we are digital humans. You know, we, we, we may not have embedded chips in our, in our um, bodies. Some of us may with whatever um, sort of heart uh, um, chips that you might have to monitor your health, et cetera, and to help pump your uh, heart uh, better. Um, but over time, I think we can start to see how we are transforming ourselves into a kind of quasi-hybrid digital human as our addiction and connection and attachment to technologies um, becomes essentially um, irrefutable. And so instead of saying that's never gonna happen to us, what we really need to start thinking about is how then do we ensure that we, we protect the rights of whatever new hybrid form we become. And indeed, because we're already there, we need to understand what it f means to start protecting those rights today. So these are just some of the transformations that I think um, we have to keep in mind as we go through these workshops. Um, you know, I think it, it's, not about, um, it's not about needing to know how these technologies work, uh, you know, completely. It's not even uh, needing to understand that um, what, the, what the kind of particularities of different platforms are and things like that, obviously that helps. But it's really about doing a number of things as you start to imagine how to transform the art sector into um, an equal partner in this digital um, next phase of the digital revolution. The first thing to understand as you move towards these conversations is one, you must adopt that mode of I am an equal voice in actually making these next stages, these next steps work as we evolve our digital economy further, okay? We are an equal voice at that table. Our thoughts must be included at that table because all of these things that I'm talking about are currently in flux. You know, the regulatory bodies are in flux. Uh, the, the creation of digital rights are in flux. 
um, how the infrastructure of virtual reality is being created is just being created right now. And so we are an op at an opportune time to actually raise our voices as the art sector to, be, to, to raise those issues that perhaps Silicon Valley technologists won't raise. And so, so it's critical to understand that we are an equal voice at that table. The second thing to understand is that um, you don't necessarily need to know uh, the technology itself or to be a technologist to actually have um, an insightful thing to add to that table, okay? Because it's important not to, to, not to um, pay, uh, not to discount the kind of conceptual and, um, and sort of philosophical contributions that you can make to the framing of these types of issues. So notion, so when I, so that's why I put things like consciousness in there. So even though the notion of consciousness, one might think, does not belong in um, technology conversations, um, it's actually happening. So you know, Ray Kurzweil in the in the Valley is talking about this idea of the singularity. People who are doing a artificial intelligence work are talking about you know what are the ethical rules and boundaries around AI creation. Um, are AI agents conscious? So don't think that these types of conversations aren't happening. They are, but they're only happening within that small group of people. And it is important that artists and philosophers and academics and, and practitioners of all kinds have a say in what, in, in what that particular issue, um, in how that particular issue gets addressed. So, you know, you have an equal voice philosophical, conceptual, and um, large-scale kind of uh, um, insights are part of that conversation, and you have as much a, an ability to add to that as, as any other sector. Um, and the third thing is um, we are the ones that are going to often um, create the actual practices that would articulate how these technologies actually evolve. Um, so I didn't talk about that in this talk because the purpose of this fund is not about art practice, but we all know uh, that we support artists who work at rethinking these technologies and end up actually creating um, expressions of them that, that unpack these issues, right? And so we're actually the sector that often drives um, through the creation of objects, through the creation of experiences, these kinds of conversations in the public imagination. So the, 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 those three things really point to the fact that it's not just the artists themselves who can actually help drive that conversation forward, it's the art institutions as well. And if we as a sector understand our role to play in that in this next conversation, this very important conversation that's, that's going to happen, that is happening right now, and take our role in it, I think Canada will be in a really, really exciting place. So thank you very much.